I want to welcome Dr. Patterson as our guest speaker tonight. But before I introduce him, I want to discuss the Ag Innovation Challenge. The Ag Innovation Challenge was the result of a grant written by Matthew McClanahan and myself to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship in agricultural students at Tennessee Tech School of Agriculture. Innovation is the research and creation of a new idea, method, and device. And entrepreneurship is that activity of setting up a business and taking financial risk in the hope of profit. So these innovation ideas could benefit the Upper Cumberland, Tennessee, or even the world. If you've ever thought there has to be a better way, then there is probably a better way. Last spring we tried, but COVID threw us a curve so we encourage the participants to compete in Eagle Works and our very own Annalisa Larson won second place. That is very exciting for her in the School of Agriculture. So this fall, the Ag Innovation Challenge will be held on November 10th. First, first place is $2,500. Second place is $1,500. And third place is $1,000. There is also an audience choice prize of $350. This event is completely virtual with the same format as Eagle Works. In fact, if you participate in the Ag Innovation Challenge, you would be on your way to participate in Eagle Works next spring. To compete, the agricultural student will submit a video to Dennis Spenwald by Friday, October 23rd, and these videos will then be sent to the judges. The video should be three to five minutes in length, and we'll discuss your innovation. It could be an idea or an actual product but you do not need to have the actual product. You simply need to discuss it. Part of your presentation might include a little research that shows there is not a similar product already on the market. I also have a book for those students who want to participate in the Ag Innovation Challenge. It's free, you simply need to come by my office. Dr. Patterson is a veterinarian and a graduate of Auburn University. He's married to April Smith Patterson and they live near Moss, Tennessee. This family has lots of enterprises from log homes, hosting weddings, farming, and so much more. I don't want to steal his story, so with no further delay, let's give a big tech welcome to Dr. Nick Patterson. All right. Hey, thank you, Dr. Fenewal. Can you, is my is audio working good? You cut out just a little bit there, but I think you'll be fine. We'll just, uh, I think you'll be okay. Let's see. Yeah. Is it all right? Is it working better now? That sounds better. Okay, there we go. And then there we go. Okay. Is it sharing my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, as Dr. Fenwall said, I am Dr. Nick Patterson. Um, I don't go by the doctor term very much um, anymore, so sometimes I even forget that. And uh, I apologize for the date not being changed. I gave I gave this same talk uh, back in March, I guess before the school and the whole rest of the world shut down from COVID. So it seems like a different world ago, but hopefully we're going to talk about some things that, uh, some good things that, that went along with that. But um so just a little bit of my personal history. I grew up on a small farm uh, outside of, of Florence, Alabama. Um, I loved education and knew that that was probably going to be a path for, for myself. So uh, I went to Auburn University and got my uh, BS in animal science in 06 and then my DVM degree in 2010. Um, I graduated in, in May of 2010 from Auburn, moved to Clay County in, in July of 2010 and, um, Many of you, even though you're within an hour of it, probably don't even know that Clay County exists. Uh, we're about an hour north of Cookville, 7,500 people. We are the definition of rural. We have no traffic light in the entire county. Um, way more chickens and cows than people. Um, but I did uh, move to this area, and I was a, an associate veterinarian at a, at a mixed animal practice uh, in Salina for Dr. John Donaldson. And I was also an associate uh, associate veterinarian at a mainly a small animal practice over around Portland for a year. Um, in 2012, everything kind of changed. I was planning on moving back to Alabama, but, uh, but God had different plans. My now wife brought in uh, Roscoe, the Basset Hound, uh, to the office with a hurt foot. And long story short, we were married a year later, and uh, and I've never left Clay County. Um, and uh, 
this is, I should have updated the picture as well. So this is, was a picture of my very pregnant wife uh, from back in February. Now we have a six month old uh, toddler uh, named Axel. And he was born in April in the midst of the pandemic. And that was really interesting uh, from, <laughs> from, from a hospital and delivery room standpoint, nobody could come. They threatened to not let me back in the hospital if I ever left the parking lot, but, uh, but, but it was a wonderful time and he's been great ever since. But, um, I did practice veterinary medicine for about one more year, um, after we were married until I transitioned to work in, in, in what we call the Smith family businesses. Um, so April's dad, Doug was the quintessential definition of an entrepreneur. Just like Dr. Fennewall said, he thought things could be better. And so he would find ways and find things to do, uh, with it. So just, just take, for example, when he moved back, um, he actually got an engineering degree from tech, worked for GE in the Mojave Desert on jet planes, but he just, he loved where he lived, loved rural America, and really wanted to provide jobs. And so um, he came back and started taking the scrap from other sawmill, lumber mills in the area and making mop and broom handles. So his story literally started with taking what other people would consider trash and trying to make it into something. Uh, and that I think that pretty well ring, rings true in a lot of the businesses that we have. But um, the sawmill itself celebrated uh, 50 years in 2018. It was founded in 1968. Honest Abe, the log home company, has been in business for, for over 40 now. Um, and we're still uh, starting new businesses today. We started one back in March in the pandemic. But uh, Doug did pass away in 2011. Um, but today, uh, my wife and I uh, operate these businesses with uh, her mother, Janie, and her brother, Shane, and we each kind of have different roles within the businesses. Um, so this is kind of a breakdown of the businesses that we, that we do have here. Moss Sawmills is a, is a hardwood sawmill, so we take, uh, uh, we buy standing timber um, or land with timber on it um, and just logs that people bring in and convert it into usable boards like you would see at Lowe's, but ours are not pine, ours are hardwood. So they're going to go for hardwood flooring, cabinets, doors, that sort of thing. GF Hardwoods takes the lumber that moss saws and dries it down into a usable product. Um, and ironically, we actually take the sawdust generated by the sawmill, and that is how we dry the lumber down. So very regenerative, very green. Um, along with that, Barky Beaver Mulch and Soil Mix, we take all the waste from the mills and turn it into mulches and soil mixes. Um, Happy Trucking is our logistics division uh, that hauls our products. Honest Abe Log Homes, we um, manufacture and build log and timber frame homes. Um, actually, every state uh, has an Honest Abe Log Home in it. We had a dealer in every state at one time. Um, we look a little bit different in that today. Mostly we're here in the Southeast in the Midwest. Um, but any, we typically build anywhere between hundred and 120 homes uh, a year. And our newest business is eco panels of Tennessee. And so it is a SIPS panel, which is a structural insulated panel system, uh, manufacturer and builder. Um, and that is our newest one. Um, with a ton of promise and basically we, we just can touch a lot more people than what we did um, with just log homes. Um, so those are the businesses that, that April's uh, family um, and Doug would have started. Uh, these are our, these two, there are these two businesses here are, are mine and April's um, kind of separately. Uh, one is the farm. So we, we row crop around a thousand acres. Um, we have uh, forages that we sell that we, that we uh, plant and harvest for our own cattle uh, as well as sell to the public. We have beef cattle. Uh, we use um, Akaushi bulls, which are one of the Japanese Wagyu breeds on our um, just commercial mama cows. Uh, and we get a premium for those calves. And we also do some uh, direct to consumer marketing of beef whenever the uh, uh, slaughterhouses aren't backed up for two years at a time. Uh, to be able to get a calf harvested. Um, and we also do agritourism. So that's where Dr. Fenway was talking about weddings. We also host uh, barn sales. We just had one a couple weeks ago. And we have been incredibly uh, blessed and incredibly humbled by the number of people that want to come uh, spend a couple of days with us here. We have between 
usually over 70 local vendors that we kind of open our farm up to. And we have some, some barns and inside spaces that they can set up and, and sell their uh, handmade local items um, and kind of use us as a conduit to get to the general public uh, to sell their stuff. And we had uh, several thousands pe of people to come through here uh, just a couple weeks ago. Typically at the time, we also kind of tell our farming story and kind of highlight some of the things that we do with no-till and cover crops and, and the cattle and that sort of thing. But with COVID-19, we really didn't do, you know, farm tours like we used to. But uh, And if you've been around the Cookville area, you may have seen this store. It's it's located on 111 out uh, by the Honest Aid model, but my wife has a store, the Mill Storehouse, and it's a little boutique, uh, specializes in clothes, uh, southern home decor, personalized gifts. Um, and if you've not been by there, you need to go, go see, she runs a pretty, pretty neat little shop over there. Um, I, I guess I entitled what we do as evidence-based entrepreneurism. That's kind of goes from my medical background. So, you know, evidence, evidence-based medicine is the formulation or treatment of, or formulation of treatment decisions by using the best available research, uh, evidence and integrating this evidence with the practitioner's skill or experience. So what I will tell you is I did not take a single business class. I should have. Looking back, I should have took it. I probably should have majored in ag business versus animal science and, and my DVM degree. But, um, and that's not to say that, um, that education and that doesn't have a place. I just didn't get that. That was not my, that was not where that was not, that was not my wheelhouse doing business every day is, you know, not my default go-to. Um, we've had failures, successes and everything in between in the last eight years. Um, and still learning every day things that we need to do to do better. So I just want to paint that picture for you as I go through some of this, because, uh, what I'm going to show you is just stuff that I just honestly had to learn the hard way. And maybe it'll save somebody some steps one day. Um, so, in, in number one, and I think this is one of the biggest ones, and it goes back to Dr. Fennewald. I love what he said. If you think there's a better way, there he is, and go find it. So, businesses are problem solvers. Every business solves a problem for someone. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care, you know, what it is. Um, you are, as a business, you are doing things that people can't or will not do themselves. And how well you solve that problem for people will dictate how successful your business is. It will dictate how successful your, your product is. Um, revenue potential is directly related to how many people you can serve and serve well. Um, and there's the quote from, from Dave Ramsey. Uh, when you get to selling, you sell benefits, not products. It goes back to the same thing. The, you know, the, the benefits are what you need to show that person, uh, your consumer, uh, what it can do for them. Um, and I guess at the very bottom there, it says beware because sometimes the problems and solutions change over time. And I'm going to give you an example. When Doug started on a blog homes, his business model was based on taking poplar trees, which are very local here. And, and he wanted to give them another purpose because at the time poplar was not worth very much, but they were very plentiful. So the very first homes that they ever made were out of poplar. Poplar is heavy and they couldn't get it to dry and they had lots of building problems. So he had to completely reinvent the business. And now we use basically Eastern white pine. And it took, it took the, uh, you know, it took the, the problem of still wanting to build someone a log home. The solution changed because of his original business plan. The poplar just wasn't going to work along those same lines for years. We just sold kits, did not build anything because we would really love for it to be that way. But over time, he figured out that the number one limiting step was that people could not find people to put up these log homes. So as of right now, instead of just offering packages, we have seven building crews that work, basically work under our construction division at Honest Day Blog Homes. It goes back to that problem. You know, every, that those two things evolved. And, you know, had we stuck, had Doug stuck to his original business plan of Poplar and just selling kits, Honest Day wouldn't still be here today. Um, this is, an, and so this is a, yeah, this is the, the next one. And that is that people matter most. Um, one of the most complex parts of business is the human element. And so you've got this, and there are several relationships in that. So one, you've got the owner and employee relationship. So if you have one other person working in your business, 
you you're a leader <laughs> um, and you very likely cannot be a one man show doing hardly anything whatsoever. And so uh, we try to go by a servant leadership, uh, which we feel is the best model, uh, which means that we really want to uh, figure out ways to anybody that works with us. We want to figure out what their strengths are, what they excel in, and we want to put them consistently in, in um, positions to where they can succeed. You know, we can't have salespeople that, uh, that are great at selling but then have company policies in place that hamper their ability to sell to the public. And so we're constantly, and those things are constantly changing. I mean, just even like, um, um, let's take for instance, the COVID-19. So all of our sales people that work directly for honest, they have a sales model that they are assigned to that is supposed to be their office. Well, out of, you know, out of caution for not only the general public, but our salespeople, we shut all of those, uh, all of those offices down. So what we had to put in place were um, online phone screenings and Google drives and everything that we could do, basically everything online that we used to try to do in person um, and, you know, and, and then put them, you know, basically have all of these things in place where they could con still continue to try to do their job, even in the midst of what we had going on. Um, and, and we did, we didn't see sales fall off, which is, that's probably a whole nother topic, but um you know, it was, it was because of us trying to figure out ways uh, that they could succeed. Um, and I think this, the, the very last one there, and there's a lot of different ways you can do that. There's the disc assessment through the Ramsey organization. There's bold, there's the Enneagrams. There's a lot of them. I would encourage you to take any of them. They tell you a lot about yourself. And when you know yourself, uh, then you can best manage yourself and also figure out how to better manage people. And it kind of goes down to that last statement. You are responsible for you. And I think that's one thing that if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to be in business, you've got to one, be most responsible for yourself first, be responsible for how you act, the things that you say, how you lead. Uh, and if you want to be a business owner, then you're going to have to set that level of sacrifice in front of everybody else of, as to what you're willing to do to try to be successful. Um, because the people around you are not going to work any harder than you are most of the time. They're, you're going to set the pace. Um, and, then, and then it kind of goes back to, to customer. And then the next part of the uh, people mattering are, are customer relationships. Um, and regardless of what business you're in, you're all in sales. When I was a veterinarian, I was in sales. I had to convince these people that were bringing their pet to me to, to one, trust me with their pet, and two, be able to spend their hard-earned money uh, to trust me to fix whatever they deemed wrong with their pet. Or, you know, if it was just vaccinations, trust to take good care of, the, of it. You know, I learned how to be in sales, didn't even realize what I was doing. And the number one thing I think to highlight on this is that people buy from people. And that is a term from action selling. It's a, it's a sales platform that goes always back to the seventies, but it's still viable today. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that I think about when I see a customer now, you know, imagine the potential customer sitting across from you with a hat on that says what's in it for me. And you're trying to answer all of those questions for them. Um, and this is a really, really good book. If you get into the sales part or even, or you're developing your own business, I would encourage you to read a story brand by Donald, Donald Miller. And, um, especially if you're developing a new product, it is absolutely worth the time to sit down because he has basically a, as a company, you're trying to tell your story of how you're trying to solve a problem for that consumer. And the number one thing that he's always wanting you to remember is that the customer is always the hero, not you. You're not the hero for helping them uh, solve their problem. They are the hero uh, for solving the problem and using you um, as a helper or a conduit to do it. Um, another, another part is to know your numbers. Um, and, uh, we were kind of, we were talking about that. Um, I mentioned that just a minute ago about, um, you know, knowing number of sales, you cannot know enough data. I don't care what you're in. I don't care if you're in farming, if you're, um, making plastic bottles or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, you have to have data. Um, but probably what you do with the data is even more crucial, you know? So, I mean, these are just some things that I look at literally on a weekly basis, ranging from um, our businesses down to our farm revenue per month, 
expenses, knowing where that money's going. Um, this we've got one here, you know, for honest aid, you know, the number of sales per number of leads that you actually get. If if everybody that becomes a lead of yours that wants to buy from you converts to a sale, I could learn from you because ours are not very good sometimes. And we spend a lot of money on people that don't buy from us a lot of times. Um, lead generated per dollar spent. This is one that we actually that, that we were tracking during COVID that went positive in our direction because we were sh shutting down, we had to shut down sales models. Um, so we didn't have the overhead of electricity. Now we still had the buildings themselves. And so we still have those costs, but um, you know, we weren't, we weren't traveling to shows the way that we normally would. We weren't having our in-person events um, up, up here in Moss like we normally would. We still generated even more leads though um, from online and some of the things that we've done from that. And so, you know, we're reevaluating some of that for 2021. Um, and then from a farming aspect, of course, like on the row crop side, you've got cost per acre, uh, cost per calf weaned, weaning weight percentage per cow. Just, you can never know enough of my numbers, in my opinion. Now, being 100 completely honest, numbers are what I do every day. That's some of my roles in the business are knowing what all these, what all these numbers are. So, um, we generate profit and loss statements. Um, they kind of tell the story of what happened. Um, so they're generally generated, you know, the months after, you know, we get them like the, the 15th of the following month. So, um, you know, it's October the 15th. We will have September's P and L statements for our businesses um, ready here soon. And they are a good measuring stick. Um, so they do kind of tell you where you're at. They just don't necessarily tell you why a lot of times um, and budgets Budgets are one of the things, um, basically you're telling the money where to go instead of just hoping that there's enough money there in the checking account at the end of the year, budgets kind of tell the money where to go. And, um, budgeting is not, not always easy, particularly in commodity markets, or even in, even if you're developing something for the first time, you don't know what some stuff costs. Uh, but at least being able to kind of track where your money's going is a very important thing. Uh, we are huge goal setters, not that, not that we set huge goals, but we are just very much into goal setting. Um, we, we have, uh, we, all of our salespeople, all of our managers, all of our production managers have um, monthly, quarterly, and yearly goals. Um, we have um, incentives for when they reach their goals. Um, it depend, you know, and they just kind of depend on what their role in some of the businesses are. Um, and we set them smart. So if you're going to set a goal, these are the kind of five things that you want to uh, adhere to when setting them. You know, you don't want to go out here and and just, you know, make something up with no kind of data behind it. But uh, they need to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. Um, and there are tons of resources out there, free resources online about setting goals. And um, I would highly encourage you to, to pursue those. Um, what we have found to be most effective is we set one big goal um, and then, and then kind of the, the monthly and quarterly goals are really just a, a conduit to try to help them set their big goal. So I'm going to take uh, honest Abe as an example. Um, our salespeople there have a yearly sales dollar goal. So if they are on goal or not, depends on how, how much they sell. Um, so then what we look at is, okay, what's going to help you get to that goal? Is it a call per week? Is it home site visits per month? Is it customer appointments per month? Lead follow up per week. And basically we let each individual salesperson set that because I can tell you these four things that I've listed are all different salespersons that do work at Honest Abe. They are the four things that each one of them says, that's what's going to help me get to my goal. There are four different people. Everybody's strengths are the same or different, excuse me. And so these are what they have said makes it now. And I can tell you just by those four different people have four completely different um, personalities and there's nothing wrong with it. They're all successful salespeople. Um, uh, and we try to um, guide them in the ways that they, you know, that we think, they should go in order to, to get to their goals. And we do help set the big ones, but we let people be accountable themselves uh, for a lot of the smaller ones. Um, Zig Ziglar, um, 
came out with Born to Win years ago. It was kind of a uh, motivational entrepreneurship kind of base uh, base uh, book. Um, this is his will of life. And so basically he said, if you were going to set goals, you need to set, to set them in seven areas of life because you, if you focus specifically on one, one of the other six are going to, to suffer to the point that they will eventually set, uh, affect even the thing that you're focusing on. And, and so we encourage, we don't necessarily see them. You know, we don't ask, Hey, what, what's your financial, personal financial goals? I mean, we, we don't, you know, get into that, but we do um, encourage them to, to set them. Um, of course, you know, we're focused a lot on the work and career because that's what our part of their life is as, as someone that's working with us. But um, I know many that, that take this very seriously uh, and we do as well on a personal level. Um, and here, these are just some random thoughts and um, these are things that I even have to tell myself every day. So it's not like I've mastered any of these. And, and one of them I would say is define what success means for you. And that has, that changes. And I'm going to give you a great personal example. And that's has changed for me this year because when Axel was born, um, success for me today is very much different than it was this time last year, because this time last year I was focused on how many acres I could get harvested in a day, how much for it, fall forage I could get planted, what my calving percentage was, making sure I didn't have any sick calves. Um, but now success is, okay, how many minutes a day do I get to spend with Axel as a dad? And even though he's six months old, do I get to read to him and take him into the cows? And, you know, so su success changes, but you know, you're the only shot that the world has at you. There's never going to be another you. No one can replace you regardless of, of what it is that you're doing or how insignificant you think that something is doing. No one else can do what you do. And so define what success means for you and what it looks like. Um, we are now in the age of disruptors and I, I, I did this before COVID. So I don't even nearly know what to say about that anymore. Cause man, the whole, the whole thing's been disrupted. But, um, and the reason that I say that is, you know, speaking of Amazon, you know, recorded record profits during all of COVID. And that's because they had already disrupted traditional retail. They were already, you know, with their delivery systems and the logistics that they had in place, they were already eating a lot of brick and mortar stores for lunch. Um, and kind of along those same lines, you know, social media has directed, disrupted traditional media. We used to, I mean, Honest Abe used to spend thousands, thousands of dollars on traditional print media, magazines, that sort of thing. We don't do that anymore uh, because we know that we were generating just as many leads from social media and online uh, resources. Um, Uber and Lyft disrupted traditional transportation. COVID-19 disrupted Uber and Lyft. So, I mean, like, you know, uh, there's kind of a, uh, a theme there and what's, you know, what's next, you know, I don't know where I, I, unfortunately I know from talking with folks, there will be some, there are some sectors of businesses that are probably completely gone forever. Um, after COVID-19, I mean, what will movie theaters look like? You know, I mean, will they even be movie theaters? Um, uh, you know, we're hoping to be a little bit of a disruptor, uh, with the SIPS panels that we're doing with eco panels, not that, I mean, they SIPS panels have been around for a very long time, but what has become way more mainstream, um, is energy efficiency in building. Um, and people are looking to get out of some more urban areas and into more rural areas. Um, now after COVID-19, that's going to be a disruptor because that's going to completely break the path, uh, and the trajectory that, um, that states and counties, uh, have been, been on for years, uh, which kind of goes down to the next thing. And that is that change is inevitable, inevitable, um, how you handle it could very likely uh, be make or break for your business. Going back to the example with Doug, how he handled his original building, uh, business plan for honest, a not really working out. Um, if he would have just continued to pursue that, trying to make it work, um, it wouldn't be here and it wouldn't have uh, been able to employ all these people for years and it wouldn't have resulted in thousands of people's dreams home, dream homes being built. And the last one, and this is one I have to remind myself of every day because I hate failure, but you will fail. 
but how you handle it is really what matters. Um, and I'm going to add another one in there. It's not on the, on the slide here. Um, and I can't take credit for this because someone asked me the other day, uh, they asked me as a farmer, what my most precious commodity was, what my most valuable commodity was. And for me, I rattled off soybeans because that's what generates the most dollar per acre for us. But really the most valuable commodity that you have is your time. And I don't care what business you're in. I don't care whether you're in ag, non-ag, medical, um, it kind of goes back to you're the only shot that the world has at you. Well, you only have so many hours in a day and we all have the same amount of time. Um, we all have 24 hours in a day. We all probably have about the same amount of working time. Um, how you, how you spend that, what you spend, what you, and what, it, and what you don't let drive you is probably um, as important as what you do let drive you. So, and especially, you know, in a school setting, you have that time to um, spend a little bit of extra time doing extracurricular stuff or uh, spend a little bit of extra time studying if it's something that, that, that you're passionate about or, or doing something like this challenge that, that pushes you to the limits of what you, or maybe it even pushes you out of your comfort zone. How you spend that time will always come back in a positive or negative manner. Um, and lastly, um, never stop learning. I love to learn. Um, these are um, some kind of personal growth uh, things that, that we do. Um, I love the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey. Um, we do a lot of entree leadership by Dave Ramsey and, and Ramsey solutions and his organization. Um, I mentioned story brand by Donald, Donald Miller earlier action sale. And there's a book called the slide edge. These are just some books that we have read and, and I read a lot of them just over and over because they're very good about just personal growth. Um, and you know, trying to be the best at whatever it is that, that you want to be. Um, and so that's it. So, um, I, I don't know if, I mean, Dr. Fennewald has my email. If anyone has any uh, specific questions, I'd be happy to, to, uh, address them. And, um, you know, I, we're, we're pretty much an open book. So, um, anything that, that you have, uh, you're welcome to come up here and tour us, tour with us in Moss. We, we're pretty open. We love to show people around. We don't get a ton of visitors up here. So when we do, we try to treat you pretty good. So, um, uh, with that, I'm going to, I'll click the stop share there, Dr. Fennewall, and give it back to you. Dr. Patterson, I've got a question. How do you, how do you okay. determine if an idea is a idea you should pursue? Pursue. You've only got so much time, and you've already got lots mm -hmm. of irons in the fire. How you do, how do you decide if there's another opportunity that you ought to reach out and take it? Okay, so for us, this goes um, one of and now, so this will be a multi-layered question. So one of uh, Dave Ramsey's biggest things are to figure out um, your your principles, who who you are, who you want to be, what you want to stand for. Okay, ours as a family of businesses, number one is to provide jobs in our rural area. That that um, without getting just too overly spiritual, that was that was my father-in-law's. He believed that was one of his callings and one of his ways to minister was to people was financially through their wallet and be able to provide jobs, but also to be able to provide consumers with products from our rural area. So those are two of our principles. So we ask ourselves, how many jobs are we going to create? How many customers can we reach? Um, and I'm going to give you the example of like, like eco panels versus honest aid. Um, some folks like have asked us, okay, why are you starting another home company when you have a log home business? Well, the fact of the matter is we could only ever supply a set amount of people with a log home because there's only a set amount of people that want one. Like, I mean, you know, not everybody wants a log home. Our SIPS panels, you can have brick, you could have, uh, you know, log siding from Honest Abe, if you wanted, you could have vinyl, you know, vinyl siding, whatever you want that outside of that house to be, it can be. So our net of customers 
increased exponentially, not from people that want specific log homes, but from people that want a home. And then we're even doing some, uh, we've done some uh, commercial stuff that we've never done before through Honest Aid. So we took, we took something that was a strength for us. We know how to build. We know how to build homes very well. We have that uh, structure in place. And we found a way to just try to get to more consumers. So I think even if you're, I think the biggest thing is determining um, what your, who your consumer is and how well you can serve them. What do you think are some of the advantages and disadvantages of your agritourism? Oh, uh, ooh, that's a good one. Um, one of our biggest disadvantages is where we're located. Um, you know, as much as we are so thankful that we had the people come spend time with us uh, a couple weeks ago, if we probably, and I, this may be slightly sound boastful and I don't mean it to be, but if we had the same facility that we have here located in Cookville, I think we would generate a lot more money because, uh, you know, because we kind of have like, uh, like big short events. So we, we try to like do it big for a couple of days because people are willing to travel an hour once, but not many people want to do it like, you know, every week for something. Um, and so, but that's also an advantage to us in the fact that, um, you know, we are rural. I think people do want to get out and drive. So it can be both a strength and a weakness. Um, I think one of the, uh, um, one of the other things for us is we do not have some of your traditional agritourism stuff in place that people want just yet. You know, like we don't have a pumpkin patch or corn maze or some of those things that kind of draw some of that type of crowd. We are working on that. Um, but it's a, it's in the works, but it just hasn't happened yet. So. You mentioned uh, some of your enterprises on the farm. Uh, can you speak to where you see farming in the future? Uh, you mentioned cover crops, regenerative agriculture. What's uh, what are you feeling there? Oh boy, I could we could do a whole other Zoom meeting on that, Doctor Fennell. But um, this is Nick Patterson talking. I have no like insight whatsoever. Um, I hope that we continue to connect the American farmer back to the consumer more so than what we have had in the past, past 50 years of farm growth. And the reason that I say that is the corn that I grow is about nine steps removed from the consumer. So a lot of our corn is going to go to poultry plants and I'm not picking on poultry plants. I'm not picking on big meat because they supply a, they supply a, a market that like your average farmer can't. So I'm not, I'm not like getting off of that train, but our, but COVID did show us, I think that our food system can fail us a little bit when it comes to the way that we're set up. And so what I hope to see are States and, and even just farmers in general coming together to find ways to address that either through local co-ops or things like that. I think the American consumer consumer is wanting to know that we take care of our land and our animals. And I think we're going to have to do a much better job of telling that story. And I think we're going to have to, um, I would love to see some more set definitions of what regenerative regenerative means for people other than the folks that can get $9 a head for a broiler that has been raised on the pasture. And, and, you know, and I, and I have specific people in mind when I'm saying that I'm not going to say names, but you know, like that, that supplies a certain market and that market is there because other people are out here still providing cheap food um, for the general public. But if we get this, if we get regenerative, if we figure out what really truly works and the reason I say that even some of the cover crop stuff that I do um, on a small scale, it's very hard to put a pencil to it because it's very hard for me to spend $30 an acre this year on cover crop to know that I got a $30 return like I would on fertilizer 
because I, because you can't see that changes. So I think that's where we're going in agriculture is maybe figuring out what some of these practices really truly do for us and the effect that they have. And when you show the American farmer that there is a conservation benefit um, and a benefit to their pocketbook, they will do it. I mean, we have done that for years. And so I hope we get a better definition of that. And I hope we move maybe more into some regionalized food production uh, where maybe we don't have to ship our cattle all the way out to the Midwest to the feed yards and us ship them back in boxes. And that's a whole other soapbox of mine that I'm not going to get off on. Um, but but I, I, hope, I hope in 10 to 20 years we look back and take this challenge of COVID-19 and we've turned it into a win for your more local farmer. What do you think? Um, so you talked about Doug wanting to take the resources in the Clay County and adding value to them, which gave jobs to people in Clay County. Um, and so what advantages do you, uh, what advantages do you find in the human resources in rural areas? These people that you need to hire so that they can help you do that. Um, that's somewhat of a double-edged sword and the reason I'm going to say that is rural people are, are some of the most loyal we have people we literally the guy the, the guy that was Doug's first employee when he started is still sawing lumber for us today mm -hmm. um, we have multiple people that have been with the businesses uh, 30 40 uh, 20, 15 years, they are an asset that we would not still be in business without a lot of those key people. What we are finding though, and I think this is a challenge for rural America is that the, uh, the next generation that are kind of coming behind them, um, are, it are a little harder to come by. Um, and, you know, our, I mean, let's take for instance, us, for instance, we, we have to make sure now that we are still pricing ourselves with the Cookville label labor market, because what used to take an hour and 15 minutes to get to Cookville now takes about 45. And, um, and so that's a good and a bad thing. Like I love rural people. I mean, you will not find any better. Um, but we, but we almost have to pay like you would in Cookville to keep those same people um, because the travel has gotten a little bit easier than it used to. Um, and then there's, you know, especially in a, in a, in a rural environment, there's just not as, there's not as many fish in the sea. So when you do catch one, you got to hang on to it really good and make it and make them want to stay, make them not want to have to drive that hour drive to Cookville or Lebanon or, you know, wherever you may be. And so I think that's a good and a bad thing. I don't think you get any better people than rural America. Um, but we've got to, uh, but you have to do a few little extra things to maybe keep them around. Okay. Nowadays. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I, I hope some of those questions I've asked and your answers generate a little bit of interest in our students to uh, yeah, think about yeah, some sort of innovation that uh, they might need to pursue. I hope so. I hope so. We've got, uh, uh, I truly believe that, you know, rural America has unfortunately, we, we've grown in disproportions to the rest of even the state. I'm going to say rural Tennessee. We've grown in disproportionately to other parts of the state. And the best that we will ever be as a state is when we can get our rural areas to be thriving at the same time as our more urban areas. And we have that opportunity before us with, with COVID-19 and with the, the good and bad that has come out of it, I would say. And so hopefully we figure out uh, ways to address that, uh, overcome them and, and us all be stronger together afterwards. Very good. I sure appreciate you coming tonight. Uh, yeah. Michael Akins, do you have any final words? 
Um, I would say, first of all, Nick, thank you so much for uh, continuing to help Tennessee Tech and uh, providing your, your great words to the students. Um, always enjoy hearing your story, and I always pick up something, uh, uh, something new every time that I hear it. And to the students, what I would probably say is, um, you know, what you're doing now uh, in the university is, is critically important from your academics to uh, the experiences that you have. And this Agriculture Innovation Challenge is certainly one of those things that uh, you just really can't get anywhere, uh, anywhere else. And what I would say is, um, you know, if you have an idea, go ahead and compete. Um, whether you think it's a good one or not, what you really need to think about is, is kind of what Nick and, and Dr. Fairwald have said is really think about what what it means to you. You know, does it solve that problem? And that's really what we're looking at. We're not looking for you to overnight own, you know, a sawmill and a log home company and all that. What we're looking for is, is your idea uh, that helps solve a problem. That's what this really is all about. Um, so I want to encourage you, just compete. Uh, it's going to really add to your academic experience. It's going to add to your university experience. And you never know, you might be able to walk away with a little money in your pocket and you might just start something here. So, um, you know, just uh, take the plunge, uh, go into it. We've got your back every step of the way. So anything that you need, any questions that you have or uh, any advice or anything, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Fennewald, myself, and uh, Dr. McClanahan are, are, are always available for that. And we just really want to, to see your success uh, in this program. So again, uh, just take the plunge, go ahead and compete, and uh, we'll see what happens. Very good. So, uh, uh, Dr. Patterson, do you have any final words, or, or, or are you good? No, oh, I'm. I think. I, yeah, I'm. Think. I think I'm good. I hope. I probably said too much, but no. um, <laughs> if uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them by by email. Once again, we really are completely open to people coming up here and seeing us and, and touring. And um, so, yeah, and, I mean, you're more than welcome to contact me anytime. Very good. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, again, this is for the Ag Innovation Challenge, and we hope that uh, several Ag students will take this opportunity to uh, uh, present some idea and win a little money. With that, thank you, Dr. Patterson. Thank you, Michael Akins. Good night.